Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? Good, Brian. Boy, oh boy, we got another triple bagger of uh, of big 100-point Kentucky Derby prep races today as we are heading to just a month away from the, yeah, from the Derby. Amazing. So, sorry to interrupt you there, Matt. Derby, Derby, Derby. It's, uh, it's, it's one, two, three. We got three huge preps. This is the biggest prep race for the Kentucky Derby of the year, Matt. Let's jump right in. We're going to start out west on the other coast, California, Santa Anita. A lot of people, and probably including myself, think the favorite for the Kentucky Derby is likely to come out of this Santa Anita Derby, Matt. We got two big names in there, Messier and Forbidden Kingdom. Let's start with Messier, Matt. He used to be trained by Bob Baffert. I think he very well may be trained by Bob Baffert again, but for the here and the now, he's trained by Tim Yachtin. All of a sudden, Tim Yachtin has a loaded stable, Matt Shipman. Yeah, he, all of a sudden, he's got a loaded uh, stable. All of a sudden, he's got one of the top uh, assistant trainers in the country in Jimmy Barnes. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, a lot has changed, Brian, but looking at this uh, Santa Anita Derby, I don't think very much has actually changed. Yeah, that's probably right on, Matt. And Messier, of course, is a horse that we knew about a long time ago. The son of the Empire Maker has looked good uh, uh, since since debuting. I guess he finished second in his debut, but uh, he looked good there. And then he's he's won three or four since. He's coming off a of fifth. Length uh, destruction of the Robert B. Lewis last time. It's been a little while since we've seen him, but he looks so good in beating lesser opponents in the uh, in the Robert B. Lewis. But of course, before that, there was a meeting between these two horses. Matt, they met in the Bob Hope way back when. Yeah, Brian, they did way back when, back uh, 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 when they were uh, they were two year olds. And we're going to take a look at, at some of that race. And I don't know if we will see the part of it that I'm going to talk about uh, in in the, the stretch run here. But early on in that race, uh, Forbidden Kingdom was pretty rank and pretty green in there. I, I think uh, the, the one thing that may have changed from that Bob Hope is that Forbidden Kingdom has certainly matured and is running uh, uh, you know, a lot more smoothly and a lot more professionally than he did in that meeting in the Bob Hope. Yeah, and Messier ran by him pretty easy uh, late last year, but you're exactly right. I mean, I'm I'm just uh, uh, taken back looking at that race again because yeah. see the fractions 21 and change 43. And you see that once in a while, but you don't usually see it with a horse that's being wrangled early in the race. And Forbidden Kingdom literally was being wrangled by his rider early in the race. So for him to run 21 and 43 in that Bob Hope after being kind of tried to be restrained and pulled back early, uh, it's crazy. It, it's, it's nuts how, how fast this son of American Pharaoh is. Sure, Messier ran by him in that seven furlong Bob Hope, but... Uh, I think Forbidden Kingdom, you, you, you know, you called it green and, and, and rank. Uh, he, there was every reason for him to get beat by a good horse after yeah. being wrangled uh, running 43. So Forbidden Kingdom certainly has, uh, I think they're letting him run a little bit more freely now. And uh, he's only gotten better, as you say, American Fire. Uh, Messier is probably the favorite off that, uh, off that last win, though. And Messier looks like a horse who could be a mile and a quarter horse, Matt, with with the breeding empire maker on top. Of course, he was a Belmont Stakes winner years ago. Um, I think it's a very interesting race. And if, if we start to look at the other horses, uh, their speed and their speed under the Tim Yachtin uh, trainer uh, listing here, Matt, because the outside horse, uh, Taba, has obvious speed coming out of a six furlong maiden win. That's his only race. And then even Arm Armanac is another horse from the formerly Baffert, now Yachtin Stable, who could show speed in here. So I'm wondering, did they set themselves up for a rabbit in the uh, in, in the Santa Anita Derby? 
I don't know, Brian. It, you you make really good points. Uh, Talba won uh, won his maiden special weight easily, more than seven lengths uh, in, in March. So it, it's hard to know how that kind of uh, uh, open length victory pointing to speed is going to hold up against. You know, when you're talking about the kind of speed that Forbidden Kingdom and, and Messier have shown in their uh, in their two starts. Uh, same thing uh, can be said about uh, uh, about Armanac. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, to me, it, it's those two. It's Forbidden Kingdom and Messier. I don't know how you separate them, Brian, to be honest. That 15-length victory, the performances by Forbidden Kingdom this year, to me, are, are almost impossible to separate. Um, uh, you know, we have seen the growth and improvement from the Bob Hope uh, for Forbidden Kingdom. I don't know. Pick them. Yeah, yeah. Two two really interesting horses. Uh, Forbidden Kingdom looks like a pure speed horse. Messier can pass horses, and I, I think if one of those other Yachtine slash Baffert horses goes out and tries to chase Forbidden Kingdom early, makes him run a little faster than he wants to. Maybe that softens him up again for Messier to come. But but on the other hand, this horse has speed that you don't see all the time. You don't see every year. This is some serious speed that he's flashing. I mean, that race in the San Felipe last time was impressive because he just ran everybody off their feet and coasted. Um, so it'll be interesting to me. I, I, th I think Forbidden Kingdom has a much better shot now than he did even at nine furlongs than he did back in the Bob Hope. Uh, one other horse I want to mention, Matt, is Win the Day. Uh, Win the Day is the horse I, I, I think I played for third in here because at Win the Day had a couple of turf trips that were not so good in his first two races. Then he got to dirt for trainer Doug O'Neill. The son of midshipman came running, rallying well roll to an easy win first start on dirt i think he's a good bet to rally again past those other horses who show speed i'm not showing Taba much respect off the one six furlong race but i think he gets tired chasing forbidden kingdom so maybe the bet for me in here is win the day for third yeah i and i don't blame you i think that is a good choice uh good choice for third if you're going to push me for a pick in this race uh brian i'm going to go with forbidden kingdom yeah, I was just going to say, Matt, who's your top pick? Forbidden Kingdom is your top pick. Forbidden Kingdom is my top pick, too. I, I you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to get much odds. I, th I think the Santa Anita odds maker there had the odds a little bit uh, too low and that there's too many points I see on the board, but still six to five, seven to five on the second choice, Forbidden Kingdom. It's hard to uh, it's hard to get excited about it, but it's an, a very interesting matchup. I like Forbidden Kingdom and his speed best in here. Moving forward, I think Messier could be the bigger threat come Kentucky Derby. We're going to go to Keeneland next, Matt, Kentucky for the bluegrass. This is the big field of the three. We got 12 listed there. There's a lot of interesting horses, but I, I think our discussion of the bluegrass really starts with the horses that ran second and third behind Epicenter last time in the Risen Star. And, of course, that's the 10, Smile Happy, and the 4, Zandon. Yes, they are certainly the ones to beat in the race. It, uh, the Bluegrass drew a field of 12. Hey, Brian, it's looking like this is going to be a year on the Derby Trail to qualify for the first Saturday in May, to qualify for the run for the Roses. You're going to need a lot of points is the way it's looking right now. And, and uh, in the history of the, you know, the points qualifying system, I think 40 was the biggest cutoff number. And we may be up around that, Brian, uh, uh, by the time this gets done. We'll see, you know, after the dust settles and who goes in and who drops out and stuff like that. But uh, it feels like a year when you need a lot of points and there's a lot of horses uh, in this bluegrass that need a lot of points to get to that kind of 40-point level that we're talking about. Yeah, there are, and I agree with you, Matt. Right now, the points look like you need to be uh, up there in the 30 range at least, and there's, uh, of course, a lot of points uh, up for grabs this week with three 170-point uh, races here. Uh, the Bluegrass, though, the, the top two look pretty secure, I think. Smile Happy and Zandon, I'd be, it would be a surprise if either one ran poorly. They've run nothing but good races, although each have only run three times so far in their career, but 
I was pretty impressed with what I saw last time. Uh, Epicenter has proven himself as a legitimate, one of the legitimate favorites for the Kentucky Derby, certainly. Neither Zandon or Smile Happy had the best of trips behind an easy leader in that Risen Star Epicenter. And um, they both came running pretty darn well, considering how the race set up for them. Yeah, and there's no epicenter in this race, uh, epicenter who has distinguished himself uh, uh, after the Risen Star with the Louisiana Derby. Uh, Smile Happy was making his comeback uh, first start of the year, and, and like you said, uh, ran, uh, ran well in there. I look for Smile Happy to move ahead uh, and improve off of that performance. Yeah, and of course, we're looking back last year at the big performance at Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Jockey Club from Smile Happy, an impressive off the pace winner. His only race this year, he had to weave through traffic, come from back when there wasn't a lot of pace behind at the center, and he was nice for second. Zandon got off to a slow start in only his third career race and his first of his three-year-old season as well, and he came running well. Uh, wide and uh, uh, just missed second behind Smile Happy. So those look like the two to beat in here in the bluegrass coming off that good uh, race in the Risen Star. Who else, Matt? There's a manual who um, was well-liked uh, in the Holy Bull, I guess, last time. The son of more than ready for trainer Todd Pletcher. Won his first two races impressively. He's a clear third choice, uh, actually, on this morning line. And in the four Fountain of Youth, he was fourth. But I think uh, it might have been a little bit better performance than the fourth place finish suggests. He was pushed out. He was wide. He tried to make a move, and he faded a little bit. Uh, I could see him improving off that for sure. Yeah, I think so. And I think trainer Todd Pletcher feels that way. He won his first two races really impressively, as you mentioned, uh, Brian. And and uh, you know they're putting him in here, taking the shot to see if he can get. Uh, if he can get second or get the win to get into the Derby, if not, you know, I'm think I'm sure they, you know, wouldn't be terribly disappointed and, and look ahead to some of the other big uh, uh, three-year-old races coming up uh, later in the year. Yeah. And, and actually the horse I think could be the fourth choice. They have rattle and roll as the clear fourth choice here on this morning line. I think Ethereal Road still could get yeah. some play. Yeah, I was a little surprised to see 15 to 1 on the morning line for Ethereal Road. Uh, of course, he's trained by D. Wayne Lucas, the other three year old, if you will, trained by D. Wayne Lucas, because everybody's talking about uh, the Philly secret, uh, secret oath. More about her later. But Ethereal Road has been improving the Sun Equality Road. Uh, one of Maiden nicely, two starts back coming from way back at Oakland Park, and then just missed in the Rebel. Uh, where he actually finished ahead of Barbara Road when second in that million dollar level. Yeah, and and he ran well in there. He actually had the lead uh, down the stretch, and as we remember, uh, got run down by that uh, uh, when Unojo switched to the inside and got a good trip and got the win in there. Uh, um, yeah, I was surprised to see the fifteen to one. I would be very excited, Brian, to to get a kind of price like that on a, on Ethereal Road uh, for D. Wayne Lucas. I think the horse has a has a shot to, to, to get a piece in this race. Yeah, absolutely it does. He was my long shot in the Rebel. I was happy with the performance there. When D. Wayne Lucas gets these three-year-olds rolling, they they rarely uh, all of a sudden throw in clunkers, clunkers. They usually keep on rolling, and I think Ethereal Road is a threat here. If somebody comes from far back, he is – the horse I like best. The other one that might come from far back would be Rattle and Roll. Interestingly, Kenny McPeak has this horse really working out fast. Uh, his first two races, uh, meh, but uh, he gets blinkers this time as he comes back to a track where he won his grade one race last year as a two-year-old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he can get again, I think we said this before uh, going into the Louisiana Derby. Uh, if he can get back to the 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 big races that he showed uh, in the past, he could be a threat in here. I don't know. Blinkers on at this point. Uh, I, I'm I'm a little uh, dubious about uh, rattle and roll. Certainly, there's others uh, that I like better. I was surprised to see command performance. For Todd Pletcher, enter the bluegrass. I thought Pletcher had said that a command performance was off the Derby Trail. So I don't know what that says that he shows up in here again, still looking for his first career victory. 
Yeah, command performance uh, is, is a horse, of course, we've known for a long time. He was uh, one of the favorites, actually, for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile last year. Interestingly, the two horses that ran at Tampa Bay Downs, the horse that upset him, Fenwick, is the two command performance here is the one. Uh, Rod Ortiz on the Pletcher horse, uh, he could pop up, but it's hard to it's hard to get excited coming off that uh, uh, pretty pretty clear beating by Fenwick, who all of a sudden is showing some speed and some talent as well and, and could do the same thing here in the bluegrass. Uh, way on the outside, Matt, you got Black Ladder and Grantham, a couple of horses who are still pretty lightly raced uh, and, and, and might uh, might keep going. You know, their last races, Black Ladder winning the El Camino Real Derby last time, Grantham running, uh, uh, what was he, second in the Tampa Bay Derby last time, Matt. Those are horses you can't throw out completely. I, I don't think you can even throw a volcanic, the horse who beat charging in his debut for performance in here. So there are a lot of options besides the favorite, I guess is what we're saying, folks. Um, Matt, but I, I wanna get to your top pick now because I, I think this bluegrass, I personally think, if I were to pick one race where the Kentucky Derby winner was to come out, it, it might be the bluegrass this year. Yeah, there are a lot of horses that, as you were just going down the list, have have good things that we can say about them a lot of horses that are maybe ones that are uh continuing to develop and could take take a step forward um certainly wide open more of a wide open field with 12 in there um i'm gonna lean towards smile happy in here I think Smile Happy looked so good last year, and I think that second in the Risen Star was just a little peek at what we might see in the Bluegrass Stakes. But I, I'm going to be very interested, and I'm going to keep an eye on the tote board to see what kind of odds we get for that Luke, on that Lucas horse, because if he does turn out to be fourth choice, fifth choice, something like that, I'm going to use him in my exotics. Yeah, Ethereal Road and the exotics makes a lot of sense to me as well. Unfortunately, having said, like Matt, that this field is a deep field with a lot of interesting horses, it's smile happy for me as well. I, I hate to be a chalk-eating yeah. weasel here, but if I had to pick one horse to win the Kentucky Derby right now, honestly, Matt, it would be smile happy. We'll see. He's at 10, pole, 10 post. Uh, maybe not ideal there at Keeneland, but uh, you know his uh, debut performance was at Keeneland. Uh, I love, I like all of his races a lot. I think Kenny McPeak has a lot of confidence in him. I think he's training really well. He's back at a track we know he likes. Uh, and I really liked his performance in the Risen Star, weaving through horses to uh, slightly outfinish Zandon in that race. Zandon obviously is the biggest threat uh, because his race is in the Remsen after a debut win. Uh, his races at the nine furlong Remsen and then the nine furlong Risen Star were both very good trained by Chad Brown for upstart. Uh, but yeah, a, a manual, I wouldn't be surprised if we ran a very good race as well. Ethel Road is my long shot, just like you. So we're very much in agreement here on this bluegrass. Let's switch to New York, Matt. And I think I think you're going to be there uh, in attendance at the uh, Wood Memorial on Saturday. Yes, I hope to to be out at Aqueduct for the for this big day of racing. And, and I think it's the the field of eight in the wood has turned out to be a, a pretty good field one of the better fields that we've had in a few years we got three horses the top three choices from three of the top trainers in the country we've got morello unbeaten in three starts for uh steve asmussen we've got early voting uh unbeaten in two starts for chad brown we've got mo donical for todd pletcher uh winner at also has won at aqueduct won the remsen um and then had a had a tough trip uh in the holy bull when he finished third in what i guess has turned out to be a key race um on the kentucky derby trail where the winner white abario and the second place finisher uh, simplification came back and won their next races. So uh, uh, you got three top trainers with three nice horses leading the way in the wood. Yeah, I agree with you. The Wood Memorial, this is a, this is a good uh, Wood Memorial. This is a Wood Memorial where a Derby winner could come out of. Uh, I don't like anyone here as much as Smile Happy, and maybe they don't have quite the potential that I see 
in the Santa Anita top two, but uh, Morello, very interesting, Matt. Morello is a son of classic empire. You mentioned the three big trainers. Of course, he's trained by Steve Asmussen. He's made his three races all at Aqueduct look very easy. I think it's going to be tough for 10 furlongs at Churchill Downs, but right now Morello looks like the horse to beat, Matt. I'm going to throw up that last one, the Gotham, and, uh, you know, Dean's List is a pretty nice sprinter, and this was a mile, but the way that Morello kind of rolled uh, and the confidence shown by the jockey here is pretty impressive. Morello is a good-looking horse who is doing good things over the track, and he stretches out one extra furlong. He's kind of moved up in distance here. This was the mile, Gotham. Now he's got to go an extra furlong, but uh, he looks like the horse to beat off of these performances. Good tactical speed, good finishing kick. Yeah, I agree, Brian. You know, I think... Uh, uh... You know, the Asmussen team and and uh, Asmussen's New York trainer assistant and Toby Sheets, uh, you know, they, they've left Morel in, uh, Morello in New York the whole winter. They've kept him away from uh, Epicenter, which, uh, you know, obviously was a smart move. I like the progression that we've seen from this horse. I like the progression in terms of adding distance each race and 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 that has not changed the outcome of the races. He, he won all his races by about four or five lengths um, and, and obviously likes the Aqueduct track, has been able to sit a little bit off the pace. Um, so it's hard to hard to fault that. It looks like, you know, as a son of Classic Empire, that he should be able to handle the mile and eighth uh, going two turns at Aqueduct. Yeah, classic empire. Uh, so he's a grandson of pioneer of the Nile. There's there's reason to believe that he will like the nine furlongs, as you say. I kind of like the progression. I was listening to what you were saying about the progression at Aqueduct and distances and staying in New York. He's avoiding his stable mate, of course, at the center, who could be the Kentucky Derby favorite. I like that for the Wood Memorial. I, I don't know if I like that for the Kentucky Derby, yeah. uh, having only run at Aqueduct and, and this being his first race more than a mile. But uh, for the Wood Memorial, I think it works, and I think it does make him the horse to beat. Mm -hmm. But these other two favorites you mentioned, uh, we'll start with uh, Mo Donegal. Uh, uh, very tough, very tough horses. Mo Donegal has a graded stakes win at nine furlongs over the track. Of course, that was a tough, tough win over Zandon last year in the Remsen. And uh, his only race this year I like. Um, it's been a little while since we saw him in that holy ball. But, yeah, he was uh, – he, he was kind of blocked and, and pushed out way wide when White Abario was doing his best running. And, and the race was quickly over for Mo Donegal. But I love the way he finished that holy bowl. And like you said, uh, White Abario and Simplification have uh, gone on to uh, uh, validate that holy bowl, if you will, because they were the two horses that uh, dominated at Gulfstream Park uh, in, in future races, like you said. So there's a lot to like about Mo Donegal. He doesn't have the speed of Morello. He doesn't have the speed of early voting. Uh, that could be a negative here at nine furlongs, depending on how the race runs. But with all these horses, there probably will be a little speed. And I think Mo Donegal is a is a threat not only here, but a threat moving forward to the classic distances. Yeah, I agree. And and you know, at Aqueduct, dep depending on the way things are playing, often you don't want to get too far behind. Uh, uh, in races, especially going this mile and an eighth. So I think that'll have to be part of the uh, of the strategy. I think Mo Donegal is getting Joel Rosario um, on Saturday, which is a good thing. Um, he's, you know, he's as good at, at judging pace as, as any of the uh, top riders. Yeah, I agree with you, Matt. Uh, he's on the rail, which I don't particularly like, but Rosario... Um, he's likely to find room, find uh, uh, the way to make the move, and, and Mo Donegal's a horse to uh, really watch out for here. As is early voting. Early voting is, I don't know about you, but early voting is still one of the biggest wild cards looking ahead to the classics for me. Uh, I, I could certainly see him winning this Wood Memorial and becoming one of the best three-year-olds in the country. On the other hand, I could easily see him not being one of the 10 best three-year-olds in the country. I saw somebody recently say Cyberknife is clearly Gunrunner's best shot in the Kentucky Derby. But what about this horse? Early voting could still be any kind. I mean, he's only run twice. Yeah. And, the, and what he did in the Withers after only a, a, a maiden special weight was pretty darn impressive. It was impressive. And, and, and you, you can't uh, emphasize enough and you can't, 
you know, scratch your head and wonder what what it all means that uh, that early voting has only run twice uh, at this point, you know, and, and these none of these horses have run that much, but, but they've all run more than uh, two starts for early uh, early voting. Um, and it has been a while now, a couple months since the Withers victory over Uno, Uno Ho, uh, who has run well since then. Uh, and won the rebel and you know uh, won reasonably well in had a, had a tough trip in the arkansas derby but uh you know what to expect from early voting um other trainers other situations i might be worried about that long longish layoff more than with chad brown chad likes to have more time between starts than less time and that's what's happening here with early voting. So uh, um, that makes me a little less concerned about it. But yeah, it's only two starts, and 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 Morello, Mo Donegal, and, and a couple of the others in this field—they're good horses. So um, he's going to have to run well to win this. He's going to have to run well to win. I, I agree with that. And and this typical Chad Brown uh, running so infrequently, but uh, running well when when they come back after eight weeks or ten weeks or whatever it is. All right, Matt. The rest of the field, I, I think there's some interesting horses on the outside. Pletcher's got a couple of long shots trying to pull a Burbonic, uh yeah. in here. Those horses look like they have some talent, but probably not in this spot for me. Uh, the interesting horses, Barizi on the far outside. Like uh, Morello, he's three for three. It's come against New York Reds, the son of Laoban. Laoban is starting to make some noise as a uh, nice value, young value sire. This one's trained by Mike Maker. And then uh, Safi Joseph has a couple of horses who intrigue me just a little bit as well in the six and the seven, Skippy Long Stockings and AP Secret. Yeah, especially for me, especially AP Secret, uh, the Safi Joseph Barn is hot. He won the training title Safi Joseph did at Gulfstream Park in the championship meeting, uh, dethroning uh, Todd Pletcher, who's won that training title. I don't know. It's some crazy number, like 18 times or something like that. But uh, was able to win more races at Gulfstream, obviously different kinds of barns, but uh, a hot Safi Joseph won the Florida Derby with White Abario. Um, AP Secret, interestingly, was last seen in the Fountain of Youth, in that Fountain of Youth that ha that was marred by the spill and the Paco Lopez rough riding, uh, and, and AP Secret was... Uh, affected by that. He was in really good position. He was in third. He looked like he had a lot of run in him and his back heels got clipped in all of that stuff that was going on behind him. And he lost his momentum uh, at that point. So um, AP Secret was running well. We'll see. He'd be shipping up to Aqueduct here. Big difference between the Gulfstream Park surface and the Aqueduct surface. Yeah, and the and the other one from Safi Joseph, Skippy Longstockings, comes off a pretty darn nice allowance when maybe he's really developing the son of Exaggerator. Matt, who's your top pick in this Wood Memorial? I'm going to go with Morella in here, as I was talking about before. I like his development uh, in the three-race career and the way he's been handled by the Asmussen Barn. And I'm going to go with Mo Donegal. I think Mo Donegal is a horse that I could be betting uh, in the Kentucky Derby, and I, I worry that he won't get up in this nine for a long uh, Wood Memorial. It really depends what happens early, I think, for uh, Mo Donegal's best chance in here. I, I do see your horse, probably the favorite, Morello, as the horse to beat, but I think uh, Mo Donegal is, is a horse that uh, uh, is a real Derby contender here, so I'm going to pick him in the Wood Memorial at nine for a long so Matt, let's quick uh, jump back to what we saw last week on the Derby Trail. A couple of big races. I, I honestly don't know if I liked any of the horses uh, a ton moving forward in the Kentucky Derby, but uh, you have to respect Cyberknife, the winner of the Arkansas Derby. You have to respect White Abari, a winner of the Florida Derby. And I think other horses in the race deserve to be respected. These are two pretty good races and good winning performances. We'll look at Cyberknife, I think, first here. 
Yeah, Cyberknife uh, certainly got a good uh, a good trip in this race. Uh, uh, we talked about Cyberknife as an up and coming uh, three year old from the Brad Cox barn. Um, I, I know I do want to. Uh, and, and I hinted about it a little bit. I do want to mention Unoho, who was in the race, who just had an absolutely terrible trip in the race, got banged around, banged into the rail uh, as a horse with one eye and, and had some serious trouble and almost had some bad thing ha happening, uh, got bumped around and pushed into that position by Cyberknife. Um, uh, so I do want to mention that that even though you know how uh finished far back uh he had a really difficult time in that race yeah and i didn't really like the filly of course she was the favorite i didn't really like the trip the filly got because yeah. she was squeezed yeah. back early and i kind of uh not ridden very aggressively at a couple of points during the race where i think she could have been and then then they made a big giant move louis Contreras, on secret oath and i think that was uh a little mistimed as well. I thought she ran well, and I think she's still, uh, she might be my favorite horse coming out of that Arkansas Derby. Uh, Cyberknife is a lot of talent, but uh, horses who still look like they are not all there mentally often have trouble <clears throat> after they win this last prep coming to the Kentucky Derby. And, I, and Cyberknife kind of makes me think that's where he is right now. He's still a horse who's running a little bit erratically and uh, Barbara road, you know, he, he keeps picking up the pieces and weaving through traffic. I, I don't think in the very, very best preps, uh, but he's certainly a horse who could hit the board, uh, hit the exotics, hit the super in the Kentucky Derby because he just keeps trying. Uh, Matt, let's switch over to Florida as well. I want to talk about that race because I, th I think there are very interesting horses coming out of the Florida Derby. First off, we don't know what, happened to Classic Causeway. Neither of us picked Classic Causeway in this Florida Derby, but uh, the performance by Classic Causeway was just a head-scratching bad performance. But the top three, the other top three, there were four four real favorites in here. They all ran well, and uh, White Abario was the best of them. But uh, the other two horses interest me as well moving forward. Yeah, uh, uh, and certainly uh, with Classic Causeway, uh, trainer Brian Lynch, is kind of feeling the same way. He's not sure what happened, uh, especially with Classic Causeway. No, no problems popped up after the race, and, and he's kind of undecided about what they will do um, with that horse. I, I'm feeling like they won't go to the Derby with Classic Causeway at this point. Um, nice victory by White Abario. You could see the others uh, gaining on him a little bit towards the end. Certainly uh, these 100-point race winners uh, are, are always have to be considered in the Derby, but I agree with you. I don't know how much I like to like either of those winners moving on to the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, you mentioned three of the four favorites, and I'm going to mention the fourth. Uh, first off, White Abario, yeah, real horse, but I worry that all his wins have come at Gulfstream Park. I worry that he might not be a true 10 furlong horse, certainly a horse to respect. Charge it uh, uh, looks like a serious talent, uh, a, a horse who, you know, he right away after the Florida Derby, I said, well, maybe he's a Belmont horse with the, the big sweeping turns at Belmont, and he looks like a horse who can run all day. I'm not sure about him for the Derby either, as little experience he has, but impressive the way he's kind of finishing off that Florida Derby. Simplification, I still think Simplification is a horse who could win the Kentucky Derby. You're going to get some real odds on Simplification now, uh, fading to third in this Florida Derby. We both said we didn't want him on the lead in the Florida Derby, and that's exactly where he was, and he was kind of battling on the lead. Uh, I thought it was a brave performance by Simplification, sticking around as well as he did, and he would be up there near the top now of my long shots for the Kentucky Derby because I don't think this is the trip that Simplification wanted in the Florida Derby. Yeah, I agree. We we both felt that, you know, we, we had seen Simplification win on the lead in the Mucho Macho Man uh, back in January, but we much preferred the kind of performance that we saw from the horse uh, in the, you know, in the Fountain of Youth. So moving ahead and, you know, veteran trainer Antonio Sano, uh, you know, he's a wily, smart, 
uh, trainer. He's going to, you know, uh, but I like the combination of, of having tactical speed, which can help for him to be in the kind of position he needs to be in going 10 furlongs in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, yeah, I would love to see him sitting in seventh in the Kentucky Derby and make a move on the turn, and I think he might be a live long shot. All right, folks, I want to remind you, uh, if I haven't done this yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at, at, here at Horse Racing Nation. It really helps Matt and I out. Matt, I want to get a parting shot from you. This was chock full of Kentucky Derby talk. Yeah, it sure was, and I guess Brian will have a lot more Kentucky Derby talk and Oaks talk coming up in the uh, next four weeks heading up to the first Saturday in May. And uh, I, as always, I want to thank everybody for watching the show. Yeah, thanks to you for watching every week. We sure do appreciate it. We're getting ever closer to the Kentucky Derby, which is exciting as Matt talked about. We will have so much on the Kentucky Derby in the coming weeks. Also, I want to thank our sponsor, the best contest site out there, that's Derby Wars. Thanks to Candace Curtis for putting together our race graphics, folks. We'll be back right here next week with another show and we can't wait to see you then.